welcome to Rundown Valley United Methodist Church's remote worship for Sunday, April 7th, 2024. We are, this Sunday, live and in person at 10 o'clock in Stone Ridge, and if you're in the neighborhood, you are always welcome to join us. Next week, the 14th, will be Second Sunday Supper. Stay tuned on, on Facebook, on our website, rvumc.org, and anywhere you can for details. Our call to worship this morning. Come, Easter people, let us worship in unity. It is good and pleasant to worship God together. It is as good as the feeling of precious and holy oil flowing freely down our face and over our collar. It is like dew falling freshly on the grass or snow falling gently on great mountains. For these are signs that God has ordained blessing and the life forevermore. We worship God with great joy. Let us pray. We come into your presence, O God, knowing that we have sinned, yet trusting that if we confess to you, your forgiveness will be as rain on our gardens, as sunshine through our windows, as smiles on the faces of our friends. Accept us as we are, but heal our brokenness, forgive our foolishness and self-centeredness. By the power of your holy love, make us fit to proclaim your truth and strong to live in your light. Amen. Our first reading this morning comes from the reading of Acts of the Apostles, chapter 4, verses 34 through 35, a description of how the first Christians worked together. Now the whole group of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one claimed private ownership of any possessions, but everything they owned was held in common. With great power, the apostles gave their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as owned lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold. They laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. The epistle this morning comes from 1 John chapter 1 verses 1 through 2 and chapter or verse 2 
from the New Revised Standard Version. We declare to you what was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. This life was revealed and we have seen it and testified to it and declared to you the eternal life that was with the Father and was revealed to us. We declare to you what we have seen and heard so that you also may have fellowship with us and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim it to you, that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him while we are walking in darkness, we lie and do not do what is true. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he who is faithful and just will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from our unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. My children, I am writing these things so that you may not sin, but if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous, and he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not for ours only, but also the sins of the whole world. Today's Gospel reading comes from the end of chapter 20 of John's Gospel. And when it talks about the first day of the week, that day, um, this is, in fact, the very first Easter day. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails, and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing, you may have life in his name. Can we all pause here for a moment and say, thank you, John, the gospel writer and evangelist? I'm serious. I appreciate how hard it is to know how and when to stop talking or stop writing when trying to convey to people 
the significance of Jesus. On this second Sunday of Easter, and yes, Easter is a season, not just a single day to stuff yourself with peeps and chocolate, I hope we can all relate to Jesus' first disciples, who are still trying to digest that first Easter morning's news conveyed by Mary Magdalene that Jesus was alive. Jesus? Alive? That's news that gives you the perfect reason to use the punctuation mark called an interrobang. It's a combination of question mark and exclamation point. Wow! Great! And whoa! What does this mean for all of us? John 20, 19 to 31, just feels a lot more conclusive than the last sentence in Mark's Gospel did last week. Remember how that one ends? They said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. But John gives us Jesus' statement to Thomas. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. And that is a statement aimed straight at us. 2,000 years later, along with everyone else who comes after. And then John honestly and humbly admits that his gospel only contains a fraction of what Jesus' first disciples witnessed before saying that what is written in the gospel is there for the purpose of your believing and thus living in his name. It's a pretty fine way to end a gospel, don't you agree? Except for one thing. John apparently shares some of my challenge in winding things down and knowing when to stop. Because after what I just read, there is a whole nother chapter. I'll leave the fish fry on the beach for another day and simply say, it's clear that understanding who Jesus is and how Jesus matters for you is a long process. And it's really no surprise that putting period the end at some point in the good news of the gospel is always going to feel weird because wait, there's more. In today's reading, we have rejoined the disciples on Easter evening right as they start trying to grasp what Jesus' resurrection means. And we can learn about discipleship and living our faith from those first disciples. So then, what does it mean? How should you live faithfully in the light of Jesus' resurrection? A few things jump out at me from to all of today's lectionary readings. Fellowship, generosity, welcoming others with forgiveness and patience. And I'd have to say that of all of those things, I think the fellowship aspect is the central one. And the others can kind of be seen as ways of living out your faith within fellowship. In the Gospel reading, John tells us that on that first Easter evening, while they're still trying to get their minds and hearts around the women's news of having seen Jesus risen alive, the disciples are all gathered together. There's good news and there's bad news here. The good news is they're together. Um, the bad news is it's because they're scared and they're huddling behind locked doors when Jesus comes. And I think the simple fact of their togetherness is important, not just for a sense of their safety and security in their very dangerous circumstances, but because it helps them confirm and check out with one another what they have seen and experienced with Jesus, both before and after his resurrection. It's kind of like when that 4.8 magnitude earthquake happened on Friday. I know ours was not the only household where we were asking each other, did you just feel something? Being together lets them come to an understanding of Jesus together. Except, what do you do when someone misses out, like Thomas? The other disciples telling him that they had seen the Lord and he hadn't, 
reminds me of the sibling torment my sister and I would regularly inflict upon each other on long car trips. One of us would announce with excitement what really neat thing we saw out of our side window. But too late, you just missed it. The disciples pull one of those on Thomas, don't they? We saw Jesus, he's alive, you missed it. And Thomas responds just the way you'd expect him to, not pleased at missing out, but doing more than the doubting we sometimes attach to him. He's flat out saying, there is no way I am going to believe unless, unless, and until he has his very specific conditions met. So there. And to everyone's credit, and as testimony to the power of togetherness, Thomas doesn't stop off, and the others don't ostracize him, because next week, for Jesus' next visit, Thomas is present and accounted for. I have to imagine that there was a lot of forgiveness, forbearance, and patience with each other going through the group in those days. The reading that Michael did from the first epistle of John contains the word fellowship, koinonia, at least four times. And it's important to realize that this is more than just a hanging out together of compatible people. It is a gathering of believers in fellowship, not only with one another, but also with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. Forgiveness and the integrity to bear witness to the truth of what we have known in Christ also feature in this reading. And the first few verses from Acts chapter 4 that Michael also read are all about the unity of the Spirit in the very earliest believers. Everything that they owned was held in common. There was not a needy person among them. They shared all that they had. It all sounds so smooth and idyllic. Imagine how the church, how the community, how the world would look and how it would be transformed if we honestly operated this way. Our me first, look out for number one culture makes this all look truly revolutionary share everything. The verse immediately before today's reading gives this little detail. When they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God with boldness. Do you suppose that if we practiced radical generosity and bold proclamation, there might be more earthquakes? That's not a completely theoretical question. For a community, a fellowship, a church to be an effective bearer of good news to the world means everyone has to do their part. The vows United Methodists take upon joining our church are that you will support the church with your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness. It's not a pick whichever two are convenient and easiest for you. It's all of them. Genuine Christian fellowship isn't just about feel-good moments. Self-sacrifice and hard work are intrinsic features of Christian faith and life. The Koinonia community in Georgia, founded in the 1940s, bore witness in their life together to the teachings of, of Jesus and the power of the Spirit. And they were repaid by being kicked out of segregated churches, firebombed, shot at, investigated by a grand jury and having their farm vandalized. Not exactly the idyllic pastoral life on their demonstration plot for the kingdom of God that they had hoped. But it was from that soil that Habitat for Humanity 
now one of the largest home builders in the U.S., grew. Quite a reminder that Habitat is deeply rooted in the teachings and example of Jesus. Community, fellowship, koinonia, whatever you call it, followers of Jesus are supposed to be together. The basic human truth of this is apparent in the New York Annual Conference's emphasis, Stronger Together. We'll put up our Stronger Together plaque just as a reminder there. And the truth of this is also apparent in the recent declarations that there is an epidemic of loneliness, another kind of pandemic that poses a public health emergency. The Surgeon General's report, report from last year says, according to an article in Vox Media, that social isolation's effects on mortality are equivalent to smoking up to 15 cigarettes every day. Social isolation, an objective measure of lacking connection to families, friends, and community, and loneliness, a subjective measure of feeling disconnected, contribute to a person having a higher risk of heart disease, stroke, anxiety, depression, and dementia, and make people more susceptible to infectious diseases. These individual health effects ripple out into the broader community. Communities with more social cohesion have less disease and lower all-cause mortality than those with less so-called social capital. They are better prepared for natural disasters and experience less violence. Reports from the Surgeon General are reserved for urgent public health issues that require immediate action. And the nation's top public health official argues that loneliness and isolation qualify. Among the many reasons that the article names for isolation and loneliness is that Americans these days are much less likely to belong to religious organizations, which have historically been a source of community connection. So being a part of a faith fellowship matters. It matters to real individual people, to you and to me, and it matters to our communities and to our world. The article says that communities with higher social capital, which can be linked to family structure and involvement, trust in community institutions, popularity of volunteerism, levels of participation in political discussions and voting efforts, and cohesion among com community members, say that all five times fast, these communities experience better health. What does this mean? It means we are called to build a movement to mend the social fabric of our nation, Surgeon General Murphy wrote. It will take all of us working together to destigmatize loneliness and change our cultural and policy response to it. Talking about community resilience and social capital brought to my mind the recent book by Robert Putnam called The Upswing, How America Came Together a Century Ago and How We Can Do It Again. Fellowship, community, koinonia, it's part of the DNA of believers in and followers of Jesus from the very beginning and still today. And whether you express and share and grow in your faith in person, on the phone, through the mail, or online, faith is not a consumer good that exists in finite supply to be used at the convenience of the individual believer. A genuine faith requires community commitment, koinonia, however that may be expressed. And spoiler alert, 
there will be other people in whatever fellowship you are a part of. And the of one heart and soul thing that Acts describes, that is an ideal that can be mighty hard to attain because, gosh darn it, other people can be such trouble to get along with. Rob Macliula, the former priest at Christ the King in Stone Ridge, said some years ago, Church is not the people you choose to be with. It is the people God chooses to be with you. From the very beginning, Jesus called people to follow him with one another. No one of us is perfect, and no congregation or denomination is perfect. But our challenge as individuals and as communities is to live in faith that we are, in fact, going on to perfection in Christian love. Pray for faith, for yourself and for those near and dear, yes, but also for those beyond the local church, especially for those who will be part of the United Methodist Church's General Conference coming up later this month. But don't stop with prayer. Work towards strengthening your faith community with those other things that church members all say they'll do. With your financial commitment, with your presence, with your time and your skills, with what and how you speak in public. Because our faith commitment doesn't end once this half hour of worship is done. That's when the real work begins. In fact, after the benediction today, you should really eat any remaining Easter chocolates you have because you're going to need the energy. Let us pray for others in the world, near and far. Gracious God, as we lift our hearts in prayer, we intercede on behalf of your beloved children, recognizing the challenges and joys that shape our shared journey of faith. We pray for those who, like the first disciples, may be wrestling with doubt or fear. May the light of your truth dispel the shadows, bringing reassurance and peace. Strengthen their faith and grant them courage to walk boldly in your light. Lord, we intercede for those burdened by the weight of unconfessed sins. May the spirit of confession and repentance bring healing and restoration. Shower them with the assurance of your forgiveness, cleansing them from all unrighteousness. We lift up those who long for genuine fellowship within the community of believers. May your spirit foster unity, understanding, and love, and create a bond that reflects the beauty of the fellowship the early church aspired to, May our shared life be a testimony to the transformative power of your grace. We intercede for those who feel isolated or lonely, yearning for connection. Wrap them in the warmth of your love and guide us to be instruments of companionship and support. May we actively seek out those in need and extend the hand of friendship Lord, we bring before you the broken relationships within our communities. Heal wounds, reconcile hearts, and inspire forgiveness. May the love that binds us together overcome any discord, and may our unity reflect the unity found in your triune nature. We pray for those facing adversity, illness or distress. Embrace them with your comforting presence and grant them strength to endure. 
Use us, your church, as channels of your love, bringing practical help and compassion to those in need. In our intercession, we remember those who have not yet encountered the fullness of your light. Illuminate their hearts and minds, drawing them into the fellowship of believers, and may our lives be living testimonies, inviting others into the transforming relationship found in Christ. And now, Lord, we bring before you the names and situations near and worldwide that lie heaviest on our hearts. Lord, as we pray for all of these needs, we place our trust in your boundless love and mercy as we pray these things and so many in Jesus' name, he who has taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.